and welcome to our sixth annual Artist Roundtable of the Princeton Festival. My name is Bobette Lister and I co-chair the Princeton Festival Guild. We're delighted to sponsor tonight's program in partnership with the Princeton Festival and we're especially happy to be part of the Princeton Festival's 17th celebration. This year, the roundtable features artists from the festival's program of early Baroque music. The artist roundtable allows us to meet the performing artists from the festival and hear from them firsthand about their experiences with Baroque instruments and performance practices as well as other personal insights about their careers and as professional musicians. Before we begin, I would like to pay special attention uh, to recognizing the original moderator of the Artist Roundtable, Marion Burley Motley. Her expert handling of the discussions and especially her personal magnetism made the round table such a success. This year, Marion decided to step aside in her role as moderator, and we thank you so much, Marion. Tonight's moderator is the popular Kyle Masson, who has served as a teacher artist for the Princeton Festival since 2018. Kyle is currently a PhD candidate in historical musicology at Princeton University where he specializes in music of the 17th century. He's also a trained vocalist and licensed music educator and delights in bringing his enthusiasm for Baroque music to new audiences. Thank you very much, Babette, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to all of you who are in attendance tonight. It is my pleasure to be here, hoping to fill the wonderful shoes that Marianne Burley Motley filled for so many years. So I will do my best and uh, bear with a rookie as you can. But I'm very excited today uh, to be with you all and our exciting panel. So for tonight's schedule, before we get to the introductions of our uh, panelists, uh, we will first introduce them, then we will have a moderated discussion where I will be asking questions and they will be enlightening you about different aspects of Baroque performance practice, the instruments and their own careers, as Babette mentioned. And then if you have any burning question that is inside of you as we go along, feel free to drop it in the chat. As we get to the end of the uh, of the discussion, I will glance through the chat and pull some of the best questions, no pressure there, but I will pull those questions from the chat for you all uh, and we will present those to the panel as well. And so without further ado, let me get out of the way and introduce to you first, Gregory John Guerin. Uh, Greg, Greg Guerin has been the, or is currently the acting artistic director for the Princeton Festival and has served uh, admirably over the past several seasons with the festival in a variety of roles. He has been the associate conductor and the chorus master for uh, such works as Nixon in China, the conductor of the Festival Baroque Orchestra and assistant conductor for Fidelio, Peter Grimes, Der Fliegende Hollander, Porgy and Bess, the Nazi de Figaro, the list goes on and the chorus master for works such as Fidelio, Peter Grimes, and Der Fliegende Hollander. This is just a short snippet of Greg's wonderful bio, which you can find online. And he is also the co-founder of Cosmologia and an excellent tenor and pianist. It is my pleasure to welcome Gregory John Guerin to the panel tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Greg. Our next panelist is Caitlin Kester. She is part of the Baroque Chamber series, as Babette mentioned, and she is a harpsichordist equally engaged in solo and continual repertoire of the 17th and 18th centuries. If anyone who plays music from those repertoires will tell you that is not always the same thing. So that is uh, kudos to Caitlin for that ability. She's a recent graduate of uh, San Francisco Conservatory of Music and Juilliard, and she, where she played with Juilliard 415, if I'm correct, and we'll talk about what the 415 means tonight, and 
along with my own passion, this that speaks to me. She aspires to expose and nurture a love of this repertoire among wider audiences in the U.S. Welcome, Caitlin Kester. Thank you so much. And next up, we have Kiara Fasani Stauffer. Violinist Kiara Fasani Stauffer enjoys playing music ranging from the Baroque to the 21st century and has had the privilege of performing across three continents. She has quite an admirable uh, repertoire list. If you go through some of the concerts she's performed, she's performed something by one of my uh, favorite uh, violinists or violinist composers of the 17th century, uh, Giovanni Pandolfi Meali. So maybe I'll get her to talk a little bit about that later. But she is also the co-founder of Time Canvas and a member of the Kramer Quartet, among her many accomplishments. Welcome, Kiara. Glad to be here. And last but certainly not least, we have Joshua Stauffer, who is a restless creative who performs music from over four centuries on a variety of plucked instruments. I love that line. And he holds degrees from the Juilliard School in Lutz, the Cleveland Institute of Music in classical guitar, and the University of the Arts in jazz guitar. So truly a multi-talented individual. Please join me in welcoming Joshua. Thank you so much. All right, and so let me stop oh, stop the share here. Uh, I thought we would kick things off. Just in my experience, I find that when you get into early music, it's not always the first stepping stone in the in your sort of path to early music or classical music, rather. So I just wondered for each of the panelists, and we'll start with Caitlin, if you could just start out by describing your path to early music and maybe a little bit about why you've decided to put uh, to put up camp here for a while and, and hang out in the world of early music the way that you all have. So we'll start with Caitlin and then we will move from there. Sure. Um, I love answering this question uh, because it sort of calls upon the greatest, some of the greatest memories um, of my life as a musician. Um, I grew up playing piano like a lot of uh, American harpsichordists and um, during my undergraduate um, degree, I happened to sign up for harpsichord lessons and continual class, not really knowing what I was getting myself into, and just completely fell head over heels in love with um, the possibilities of the harpsichord and the feeling of the harpsichord. Um, my, the feeling of my, my body and my music making tools at the harpsichord is so different than I ever felt at the piano and it just felt like home. Um, and so from my undergrad, I sort of had to make this decision or I felt like I had to make this decision. What do I want to do next? And um, the answer was pretty clear for me. I wanted to just play the harpsichord for the rest of my life. So that's my journey. <laughs> yeah, that that's a very powerful, uh, powerful anecdote, very powerful testimony, that feeling of finding a home, I, you know, that aha moment. Um, mm -hmm. Greg, what about you? I think maybe coming from the choral world where we're dominated by these sort of masterworks um, and then early music, I just, early music for vocal music also extends much further back sometimes. So I'm just wondering for you. Yeah, that's a great question. And my first exposure to early music or so-called period performances or historical performance practices when I, it was when I was an early teen. And of course I had heard the certain works of Bach, mainly the orchestral works played by modern, modern orchestras on certain popular CDs and things like that. But then on Sunday mornings, I often had church jobs and I would drive to the church jobs and I would always have NPR on. And my local station in Western Massachusetts was WFCR at the time. Now it's New England Public Radio. But one of the hosts there, I believe Steve Carrillo, started to play a different Bach cantata at the same time every Sunday morning. So pretty much every Sunday morning for about a year, <laughs> I got to hear a different Bach cantata every week, and he was playing these brand new recordings by this great ensemble in Japan with Masaaki Suzuki. And I just fell head over heels in love with the sound, just the practices. And that's when I started exploring kind of this world a little more. And it was about the time, same time where I started 
organ lessons in kind. And I was lucky enough to take from a great uh, organ professor. He was the organ professor at Mount Holyoke College at the time. And luckily we had two great instruments. We had the big Skinner in the front, which was more for romantic repertoire. But what I really fell in love with was in the back of the chapel, they had a pipe organ built in the style of 18th century Dutch and German masters by the noted organ builder, Charles Fisk. And so that was a completely new world for me, tracker action, or so where the keys are directly connected to the pipe with a, with a tracker or a small piece of wood. And it's just, I, I have never turned back since. I have many interests, but that, that was the point where it really caught my attention. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that, Greg. I, yeah, that, that experience, that sort of tactile experience is, I think, very important to sort of Baroque instruments when you're, when you're actually with them. So thank you for that. And how about, let's see, which of the stoffers shall we choose? How about Kiara? Well, so I actually um, grew up in Switzerland, where Baroque music is, or early music, the early music movement is a little bit more mainstream, I would say, than in the States, or it's a little bit older than here. And actually, the university I first went to, to study modern violin, was in Basel, and they have one of the biggest early music schools in the world, I would say. So even though I was studying modern violin, I was really exposed to this different sound world and I got really interested in it and in during my master's there I actually minored in Baroque violin but I somehow still had this impression that I really needed to be good at the modern violin and to make sure I could play all my concertos and excerpts and all of this <laughs> because it somehow there's sometimes this preconception that choosing a Baroque, a Baroque instrument over the modern instrument is for people who can't handle the modern <laughs> instrument or they're not good enough to take that path. And somehow I, even though I knew this was really stupid, I kind of gave into it a little bit and kept going with my modern violin, which of course I don't regret. That's a great instrument as well. Um, but then when I went to Cleveland, um, I actually got in touch with Julie Andrzejewski, who teaches violin at Case University, and she let me play in the Baroque Ensemble there, and somehow I really rediscovered this again, and then really was like, okay, this is for me, I love it so much, <laughs> and it just really felt like home. I love how it seems like in the early music world, people are so into what they're doing, which, not to say that in the modern world this is not true, but somehow I feel like early musicians have so much curiosity about what they're doing. That's probably why they pick these more rare instruments. And I'm really um, fascinated with that and just exploring new things. Yeah, there's the, the terrain of early music is not fully, the, the cartography has yet to be fully mapped out. So yeah, there is that area, area of exploration. So yeah, thank you for, I understand why that might speak to you. And Joshua, I know your, I think background is mainly, or was initially in not early music as well, in, in jazz and jazz guitar. And, and then you found your way to early music. Is that right? So maybe maybe you could tell us a little bit about that journey. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, it hasn't been a direct route for sure. And in fact, there's uh, some earlier chapters to the story. I grew up as a Suzuki violinist, actually, which is how I met Kiara. We were stand partners in a modern, uh, a modern orchestra playing contemporary music in Hungary, actually, at a summer festival. But um, I discovered the electric guitar in high school and just like totally fell in love with rock and roll and and, and played a lot of rock uh, and wanted to do that professionally but uh, my parents thought i needed to, to get a degree so i went to jazz school because that was like the way that you could major in electric guitar and i really fell in love with jazz and ended up uh you know really going that direction with my career and um after we got married and we moved to cleveland um i had always been kind of unsettled in the jazz world to some degree because i really wanted i love the experience of improvising and i love the experience of playing music with people so these are are two um Kind of really important i would say things that have always stayed the same for me and um i also love the experience of creating music from silence um, especially performing in really acoustic places where the in, you can interact with the room as part of your instrument and some of these held true in jazz i love playing with my friends i loved you know improvising but the venues were often not super acoustic and uh often it was playing in bars or things like that which is fun sometimes but 
I was a little bit unsettled. And so after we moved to Cleveland, I started getting into playing um, some contemporary classical on the electric guitar and then realized that I might actually be more at home in classical music, given the things that I wanted to do in the, in the concert space. And so I moved fully into being a classical guitarist and, and uh, went to CIM. And uh, when I started there, actually, Julian Trzeski, who uh, Kiara just mentioned a minute ago, um, kind of flagged me down on, on day one and said, like, hey, you've got a background in jazz. You're going to be a continuo player. Here's a fiorbo. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't have a whole lot of time or energy uh, to devote towards it that first year. But I learned enough to kind of play, you know, my first couple of chords. Uh, and it was in the back of my mind that as I as I wrapped up my degree, I really wanted to explore this more. And um, so after I finished there, I kind of I dove into playing it pretty much full time and um, and haven't looked back. So it's the perfect com combination for me of, of I can always play chamber music, which as a classical guitarist, it's a lot of solo repertoire. And um, I still get to improvise, which which I really love. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'll have something to ask about improvisation, certainly later. I, in each of your stories here, we picked up, you know, Caitlin, uh, well, of course, I was taking piano lessons. And then someone was like, hey, here's a harpsichord. And well, I was an electric guitarist and jazz guitarist, and someone threw me a theorbo. Or even with Greg, you know, this encounter with an organ, right? So I just, we'll start there, Greg. I'll have something to ask as well about the vocal side of things, but I was just wondering if um, we'll s maybe start with start with Kiara, if we could talk a little bit about your instruments and how the experience of playing them is different from the modern instruments. And Joshua, you have a little extra homework. You need to tell us what it means to major in the plural lutes as part of this, which is pretty cool, I thought. So Kiara, let's start with you, your, your instrument and how you think about that relationship to the modern sound, the modern violin, that pressure you talked about in your last, your last answer. Yeah, so the, the Baroque and the mo modern violins, of course, for anyone who saw our concert yesterday, like they look pretty similar. Like you can't necessarily see any huge differences. Of course, in the instrument itself, the strings are different. We use gut strings as opposed to steel strings, which I think greatly changes the feel of getting sound out of the string. For sure. It's in what, just, yeah, in what way? Well, with the gut strings, somehow you get to dig a lot deeper. While with the steel strings, they are very powerful and very easily, they speak very easily. But I would say on a technical level, like I would use probably a lot more bow and a lot faster bow on a modern violin than on a Baroque violin, where it's all about getting into the sound, into the string. Otherwise, the string doesn't really speak so well. Um, and maybe... If, again, for who saw our concert yesterday or tomorrow, <laughs> one thing that is very different is actually the bow. That it really, it curves in a different direction, which also obviously makes the physics of it um, work quite differently. So I would say that's probably the biggest difference is the right arm as opposed to the left arm, which is fairly similar for the most. Yeah, I, so uh, maybe just before we move on, so are the dangers, are the, the mistakes or the dangers of the sound with the, the Baroque violin, do they differ from the modern violin? So like you mentioned, like if you're not really digging into that sound, what is, what is the danger of playing in that way? Or what are the problems that result if you weren't to use this specific technique? Well, you really can't get a very good sound out of it. So it gets very, like you just can't get a good core of the sound. There's not a lot of depth and there's a lot of squeakiness which this happens with gut strings anyways <laughs> and with the humidity we currently are dealing with that's definitely a problem even on the best days but if you you know if, if you approach it the same way as a modern instrument you definitely have even way more um issues with that and i think in some ways also from the music in some ways baroque music is a little bit more straightforward harmonically and everything and i i think as such we talk a lot more about shaping different things to a bigger extent maybe even though of course we do this in in more modern music as well but i think if we don't do that in baroque music it tends to come across as very flat <laughs> and a little boring <laughs> to listen to and so i think the you know all this bow action that we were talking about has a lot to do also with like really getting the most out of every note. 
Yeah, I think the Baroque violin is so connected to the voice as this rhetorical device, and yeah. you have so much control with that particular instrument. Uh, well, how about Joshua? Uh, lutes, <laughs> what do we have going on there? And then the instruments that you're daily involved with, what, how, are they differ, how do they differ from some of your other modern instrument experiences? Yeah, so uh, lutes are a never-ending world. And if you ask me, uh, you know, how many lutes I need, the answer is just one more. <laughs> and uh, the, the lute community is, is really, you know, fantastic and welcoming. And one of the things that's been really amazing is that uh, everyone has a number of instruments and tend to be pretty generous with saying, uh, oh, here, like, take this instrument and try it for a little while and, and uh, get some experience with it. So uh, I primarily play the theorbo, um, which is the biggest of the lutes. Um, it's a, a bass lute that showed up around 1585 or so um, when singers were trying out a new style and they wanted to have extra bass support. So uh, this is like, this, you can think of this as like the acoustic guitar of the 17th century for like all the singer songwriters doing their, their jam. Um, so lutes are not actually guitars uh, and there are some significant differences. Um, for one, lutes are always built to the brink of disaster. That they're just like ready to explode at any moment. And, uh, guitars tend to be a little more stable, um, and uh, part part of that difference is in how they're uh, how they're framed. Lutes have a rounded back made of many ribs, um, and uh, so the, yeah, it's just a very different experience to to play a lute. And actually, when I first started, uh, actually when Kiata first started playing some Baroque music again when we were in Cleveland. She wanted to do a project with the ensemble. We had Time Canvas, and uh, I think it was like a Cooperon piece or something. And she was like, hey, just can you play this? And it was like figured bass, and I had no idea what this was. And it took, you know, some figuring out. But I played it on the guitar, and it was a really hard experience. It was like it, it was never loud enough, and I like didn't really feel like I was adding anything. It was just really, it was like a very, I felt like I was fighting an uphill battle the entire time. and. For me, the experience of, of getting a theorbo and actually playing on, you know, gut strings with this enormous two meter long instrument um, with super confusing strings, everything's out of, out of the order from where you expect it on the guitar. Uh, as much as it was a disorienting experience, it was also, it made the music make a lot more sense. Um, and I think that's kind of something that I've heard from a lot of my colleagues as well, uh, coming to these Baroque instruments and getting to know the instruments on their terms, not on our kind of modern terms, is a really good window into understanding what these composers might have been, might have had in mind when they were writing this music. Sure, yeah, thank you for that. Have you ever had anyone say, oh, you play like such a guitarist, like when you were first starting out? Is that like the kind of thing? Definitely. That, like a teach, yeah, okay. I just wanna, I don't know. And maybe so as we move, I'll have Caitlin answer next. Is that like a harpsichordist teacher thing to be like, ah, oh, you, you're playing like a pianist or something like that? Actually, yes, um, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, well. Yeah, so the, the differences between um, the harpsichord and the piano are, are great, um, are huge. Um, the, I mean, you, you have keys that you're playing with your fingers and perhaps it's generally a similar shape, kind of, um, but the, the way that you're producing sound is so different. Um, you know, with the piano, you have felt hammers hitting six strings um, and you play to the, the key bed and um, with a harpsichord, you have um, strings that are being plucked by these very small um, pieces of delrin or bird quill. And so the, the action is very delicate and it's um, a lot of piano playing involves your back and um, the arm weight and all this, you know, powerful stuff. Um, but on the harpsichord, you have to be very sensitive and very delicate and feel the string, the, the tension of the, the, the small piece of equipment against the string and um, manipulating how this small um, plectrum is plucking the string. And so um, a lot of um, pianists may sit down on a harpsichord for the first time and think that that they can use as much power and as much weight. Um, and instead all you get is this slapping of wood against um, more wood uh, kind of sound. Um, and 
something that's very interesting about that experience is um, uh, you, you realize that you have to use a different kind of tool to create dynamics and to create resonance and to create variety. And it's, um, yeah, it's for me, it's, um, it's what drew me to the harpsichord so much, this kind of very delicate, sensitive um, search for the perfect touch and always feeling, trying to find um, this sweet spot where you can feel the string almost as if it's under your own fingers. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm jealous of my colleagues who play instruments where literally the string is under their fingers or, um, you know, they're, they're hugging their instrument, their cello or their theorbo or their violin. Um, but with the harp support, I feel so much closer to that than I ever did at the piano because I'm feeling this, the pluck of the strings. And um, yeah, it's a really beautiful experience. Yeah. I, so before I move to Greg, that kind of this. Uh, so in your bio, you have Caitlin at uh, Thomas Beecham quote, a famous conductor um, about yeah. the sound of the harpsichord as, quote, two skeletons copulating on a tin roof end quote. So I, you're already <laughs> speaking to this a little bit, but how does your approach to the instrument and, and I think the early mo the, the early music um mm -hmm. movement in general has gone a ways towards counteracting that sentiment which was very oh, yeah. prevalent for a long period of time a lot of these instruments and kiara you've spoken to that a little bit as well the way you play this instrument doesn't work if you're approaching it from a particular angle so i'm just wondering how you <laughs> think of what you're doing as counteracting that sentiment or what maybe what beecham was getting at why he was thinking that way and how you see yourself responding to that sentiment yeah, well, um, I I, I remember first um, uh, one of my first teachers mentioned that quote or something, and I of course I thought it was hilarious, um, as many people might. Um, and you know, if you sit down at the harpsichord and you just throw your hands on the keys, it kind of sounds like that. You know, um, it's it's not. Um, it's not, you, you know, a little, I teach a lot of young uh, keyboard students. I teach both piano and, and harpsichord students. And um, a lot of little kids can sit down on the piano and throw their hands down. And it, it still sounds like a piano and it sounds nice. You know, it's a, something familiar to us. But if you do the same kind of thing at the harpsichord, it will not respond to you and um, will sound quite clunky. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll, if you read treatises um, written by um, real harpsichordists and harpsichord composers of the 17th and 18th centuries, they speak to this search of the perfect touch. Um, Fresno Couperin in L'Art de Touche and the Clavecin, um, he writes that um, the, the Clavecinis uh, before him, all of these great French harpsichord writers like his uncle Louis Couperin, um, other figures from the tradition, they were always looking for this bel souplesse, this supple touch, um, and having this suppleness in your hands and um, getting in touch with the pluck of the string creates this really beautiful resonance. You sort of can't force it. And it's the same like with, um, you know, gut strings. You can't force them to do something. You kind of have to sink into it and find this sweet spot. And then the instrument kind of comes to life. And it's a really beautiful thing. So. Um, that's what I'm always trying to do. Um, yeah, I guess. If yeah, and I think if you're not, uh, yeah, no, that's good. I mean, if you're not trying to do that, you do get the two skeletons, maybe. But, yeah, you know, exactly. it's in pursuit of something else. So, uh, Greg, um, as as a conductor of uh, primarily a choral conductor and and a and a vocalist, I just this is maybe a little bit trickier to ask of you. Uh, the, the voice as a period instrument. And like, do you have a philosophy that you bring when you're either leading singers or when you're performing stuff from this repertory? I'll tie that in. You, we have a, also a, a comment here in the chat from uh, Takako Lento. How do you reconcile conducting Bach chorales with leading the Nixon in China or Wagner or Britain, et cetera? Uh, so yeah, maybe some comments on the sort of vocal production side of things. And then the, I'm the conductor achieving a particular sound question, which uh, I know are two different things, but. Absolutely. So. As a conductor, it's a multifaceted thing, and I want to integrate Takako's question into this because it's a very, it's a great question. But when I am conducting, say, the Baroque chorus, I do very similar to what Chiara said, especially with phrasing, thinking about the phrasing, and especially thinking about color and really how it kind, of, how the harmonies just kind of settle in in certain places, and how those 
affects or what the, the idea or certain things that you want to convey come through both for your musicians and for your audiences. And to do that sometimes with vocal technique, and I always maintain first and foremost that good technique is just good vocal technique, no matter what situation you may be in. It's more of a question of style. And so for me in the Baroque period or in the 17th, 18th centuries, it varies depending on what piece I'm preparing, but say certain types of vibrato in a vocal piece is more of a color in a way than say something that's as consistent say in 19th or 20th century operas. And partially that's due to, of course, opera houses got bigger and bigger and bigger as the centuries passed. And in the days before mics, and most operas are still performed by vocalists without mic, uh, mics, it's, they, they had to find ways to fill that house. So it was partly out of necessity, partly out of style. And so you have to think of those historical precedents, and then you have to th think about certain historical styles, reading the treatises, de depending on what you're preparing, and just try to find the right way of teaching a piece in which that style will best come through. So obviously my approach to doing a Wagner opera course will be very different than doing the Monteverdi Vespers, for example. I know that's an extreme example, but you get the point. And I, I love that, the idea of the souplesse too, um, especially with French Baroque music. I've done a little bit of Jean-Philippe Rameau and the Grand Motet, and the, the Grand Motets. There's, there isn't a lot of choral music in the French Baroque tradition, but what there is, is fabulous. And even sometimes reading the keyboard treatises can inform your opinion about how you approach vocal music and how and many of the treatises on vocal music can inform how, say, I play the harpsichord or the organ. So that was kind of a circuitous answer, but. No, no, I think, and I, both of you, you know, when you're talking about these treatises, I think it's important to realize that so often, so, you know, so much of, what writing about instruments or voices connected to each other. So the violin is this sort of epitome of the human voice. And some people will even write that the trombone is this sort of epitome of certain types of voices, but it's all, you know, they're all thinking in these sort of interrelated terms. So I, I think that's very important to bring up. So Greg was kind of talking about this sort of uh, approaching the piece and thinking about, you know, locating in a specific style, but the technique being the technique sort of thing. But this this sort of idea of different eras and styles, I, I it didn't, you know, uh, I didn't miss the fact that Kira and Joshua, you all belong to an ensemble that specializes in modern music <laughs> or new compositions, 21st century stuff and early music. And so, again, I, we always see this with early music, people wearing multiple hats through the musical era. So I wondered if you all could comment about the sort of philosophy uh, that lies behind that choice, and then maybe sort of some of the commonalities, uh, some of the commonalities that you kind of see in, or, or differences that you see in working in such disparate uh, chronological periods. I feel like both these very far apart periods of early music and new music um, required this curiosity we were talking of before, because in early music, we really seek to discover how things were done at the time. And in new music, of course, we're always trying to find new ways of expressing ourselves that maybe have not been done before. <laughs> but either way, I feel like um, the common ground is of course that we, even if we are early musicians, primarily now um we do live today <laughs> and as such like early music yeah we want to find out um you know how things were done and be as accurate and faithful to the sources as possible at the same time we very much want to have something to say to our audience now and i feel like as such it's never i don't know i feel like everything connects in that way to you know, what we actually want to express, what, like, the reason we really do music is to connect with people, right? And so in that sense, I feel like there's not this, for me personally, I don't feel this great disconnect between the different 
um, styles or eras of, of music making. I don't know if you... Yeah, and I would actually say, just add that for me, playing like historical performance um, is an act of, of new music. And, you know, it's, it's, it's inspired by, it's derived from, you know, this amazing tradition that we have a really actually fantastic record of considering how long ago some of this stuff was and the scarcity of paper and just like, I don't know, looking at some of these texts and realizing that they survived 400 years and all kinds of wars and disasters and people throwing them in the attic and whatever. And we still have them. It's incredible. Um, so I, you know, I, I, it's really, you know, a super precious thing to have this, this record of the past and to kind of sift through what their intentions may have been. Um, at the end of the day, you know, music is sound and uh, it's, it's sound passing from one person to another. And, and I never want to let that too far away from, from my intention. Um, and so it's, I think this is something that we always, we're always, we always have to make choices in, um, as performers uh, about how we want to do things. I think the best thing we can do is be as informed as possible and then um, make decisions that reflect that information that we know and also uh, really speak to us. And I think there's, there's like some, some, some pretty, you know, for instance, in, in the guitar world, um, today, a lot of the times we really like a dark sound, like classical guitar that has this like dark, rich timbre. And that's kind of what we associate with like a, an acoustic plucked instrument, um, for the most part. And, uh, if you, if you read early 17th century treatises, they were playing with nails at like a 90 degree angle right by the bridge, which gets this like super silvery, sparkly, clear, brittle <laughs> kind of sound. It's a lot closer to the harpsichord than it is to an, a classical guitar. And, you know, I think to modern ears, if you play like that all the time, people would be like, that's not, that's not a nice sound. It's not what I want to hear. And of course it's nice as an effect, but um, I think it's also okay to kind of acknowledge that to some degree, you know, our tastes aren't exactly the same and, and we can help help people rediscover the way that those old sounds are beautiful. Um, and we can also uh, be where we are. And that's, we can just hold those two things in tension. Yeah, you, you've touched on the fundamental sort of uh, back and forth with the historic, you know, the hip people, the historically informed performance people navigating that divide that was eloquently said. Uh, Caitlin or Greg, did you have any thoughts on, on that sort of question, bridging the divides? Uh, if or if, did you have anything? Yeah, Greg. I can speak to that. I mean, my experience yeah. is, is that, say, music until written until the middle of the 18th century, I find so many similarities between the early repertoire and a lot of new music because so much of it is left to the performer. Obviously you have to do your homework and the research and everything else. But then when you do that, there is a degree of just freedom and just the return of improvisation in many contemporary classical pieces is just a wonderful way of kind of connecting the old and the new. And also, this is just more of a sociological point, speaking as a conductor in several different types of circumstances, is that oftentimes the new music ensembles and the earlier music ensemble or historical performance ensembles are quite democratic. I remember the first time I was hired to sing as a sub at, in the Handel and Haydn Society Choir years ago. And it was my first time in, in an environment like that. And so we're in Symphony Hall in Boston and we start rehearsing and then the conductor stops and the players start talking across the room to one another. And as someone who grew up with seeing modern orchestras with the one conductor going up to the podium and what that conductor said went, no questions asked, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, what is going on, <laughs> right? And so you realize, and then I realized it with new music ensembles too, it's just, even if you're conducting, even if you're at the podium, there's just this assumption for, of, and there's, there's this respect for everybody's niche, everybody's expertise and everybody's training. And in a way that the more you know, when you're preparing a piece to conduct, 
It's just, it's not a matter of having all the answers. It's a matter of ha A, asking better questions and B, asking those qu better questions to the right people. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. You know, it is funny. No one really does enter the early music world and then say, you know, I'm going to be in charge of all this. I mean, Jean-Baptiste Lully is a, a famous example of someone who took autocratic control and killed himself by stabbing himself with his conducting baton. So it's a, a lesson well learned yeah. <laughs> for the rest of us. <laughs> Kate, Caitlin, <laughs> Caitlin, what are, what, uh, how do you sort of navigate this sort of space of moving between uh, between these eras and after this sort of philosophical sociological point we'll we'll come back down to earth with the next question but caitlin <laughs> sure well um nowadays i mean i've been playing hearts accord for several years now and um i the only context in which i um play music written past 1800 is when i'm teaching my piano students or um if I'm playing a modern hearts chord piece, um, which I don't really do too much of. Um, so I, I don't spend a lot of time um, post 1800 these days. Um, but, you know, something I um, find kind of on this topic really wonderful about being um, a, a hip person uh, and a historically informed performer is that um, I have felt myself discovering that there are so many more possibilities um, for musicians or, or as a musician than I ever um, thought possible, um, you know, several years ago before I first touched a harpsichord. Um, sort of things like, um, you know, as a harpsichordist, um, a, a piece of the repertoire that I really, really love so much is um, prelude kinds of music and improvisatory solo harpsichord music, um, toccatas, like um, what I uh, played yesterday um, by Frescobaldi or unmeasured preludes by French um, uh, composers. Um, and this practice of kind of improvisatory prelude music um, is actually something that existed in keyboard repertoire far later than many people realize, well into the 19th century um pianists were improvising preludes in their concerts and um that's totally something that's not a part of the modern piano the, the kind of general modern piano world today um and so just kind of realizing those sorts of things or or um listening to late 19th century first recordings first recorded music and hearing how people are expressing themselves really differently than the standard practice today like those sorts of things i find very um inspirational and there's just this wealth of possibility for musicians and continuing to go on that um, exploration and find new ways to be expressive and new ways to mix sound together um, is really exciting to me. Yeah. 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 So, all right. So, so that's the philosophy. And, and I think you've all spoken very eloquently to that, that sort of orients you towards this field. All right. And mm. Caitlin, you just mentioned the Frescobaldi. And so maybe that is a way to tie in. We have a question in the chat. We'd love to hear a bit about how you approached last night's repertoire and what we can expect tomorrow. And I too was wondering for each of you, favorite pieces you have from this particular concert or uh, mm. if you select a couple of pieces you've been involved with, what they require, do they require different things or what are the unique challenges or mm. some of the most significant challenges that you encountered in the particular repertoire that we'll be listening to here? Uh, maybe we can start with Greg. Well, I'm glad Caitlin mentioned the Frescobaldi because I was just enraptured by how, how Caitlin played it last night. And it's just, I was telling my colleague Becky Brett, who's the interim executive director of the organization, we were sitting next to each other backstage. And I said, I just love how it, there's, yes, we know the notes are written on the page for the most part, but at the same time, there's this certain elasticity that makes it sound improvised and it all, and, and the form kind of moves organically like you're experiencing it in the moment for the first time, even though I have heard it a few times before. And so it's a real tribute um, tribute to Caitlin and her skills because it was just 
it was wonderful. So that's my short answer. Thank, thank you, Greg. Then Caitlin, maybe you could also just add to that. I, I I don't know enough about the Frescobaldi manuscripts or the addition, like how much of it is written down um, and how much of it do you have to add? Sir, I, Joshua spoke earlier about continuo playing where you're realizing a continuo and I know that's part of your practice as well. So I just, maybe you could comment on that before touching on maybe another piece or yeah, or this piece as well. Yeah, well, um, just, well, first of all, thank you so much, um, Greg, for your kind words. It, it really means a lot to me. Um, so the, uh, the Festival of Toccata, um, the Toccata form is a, a very old, very early form in keyboard music. Um, and um, Frescobaldi was sort of at the end of the, I mean, Bach, of course, um, later um, wrote many incredible keyboard Toccatas, but um, uh, a lot of people could say uh, and do say that Frescobaldi sort of perfected the form um, and made it this really um, virtuosic and wonderful thing. And um, uh, basically, um, the Toccatas um, are pretty fully written out um, in, you know, standard notation with measures and everything. But um, he has a, a wonderful preface to his Toccatas uh, and to many of his, his works that sort of explains the approach and um, it should uh, be kind of improvisational um, because it, it is coming from this tradition of improvising a kind of prelude type of piece of music um, as a keyboardist. Um, and there are all these different sections and he even says that you can play these sections out of order. Um, you don't have to start in measure one and go to the last measure. You can you know, play the first section and maybe play a middle section and then kind of jump around. And um, so it's sort of as if you're sitting down at the keyboard and just kind of well, I'll start in this sound world and then that takes me here and then that takes me there. And this is a cool idea. So maybe I'll do this next. And so it's that sort of approach. And then also on top of that, there are certain sections like in the one I played, uh, there are a few bars of just chords. Um, and when you see a section like that, um, it sort of invites you to channel your continual player part, part of yourself and roll things in different ways, or maybe add some diminution kinds of ornaments or um, linger in certain places, or, you know, kind of make something um, of it instead of chord, 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 you know. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the Takata. Um, yeah. I, I love the idea of, you know, sort of choosing the sections. It's like, you know, while I'm singing Fares Requiem and we'll just start with the Liberame. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe, well, you know, it's just kind of, but no, it is this sort of fundamental uh, different or a different orientation towards what a score mm -hmm. tells us and how we get our way through it. So um, what about, yeah, what about uh, Joshua? Yeah, so I'd love to, uh, I, I, I saw the, the question come in as well, and I thought I might wrap some an answer in on that at, at the same time here. Um, yes. So I, the reason that I love playing this music is because it's uh, the, the the era of the basso continuo, and that's really the music that I that I specialize in. You know, from right around 1600 to about 1750, give or take. Um, and for me, uh, my instrument, um, the theorbo, is really the predominant. Uh, or one of the predominant instruments for the early 17th century. Um, it's very influential, as I mentioned before, for singers. Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a really important part of this kind of developing style. Uh, as we get later in, this, in the 17th century, and, and certainly in the 18th century, the keyboard starts becoming a little bit more predominant. And composers are writing now, instead of with the voice in mind, are thinking maybe a little bit more from the keyboard. So the bass lines get more keyboardy, or and uh, and they get harder to play on this enormous instrument. Um, the theorbo has a string length that's closer to the upright bass than it is to the cello or the guitar, and so the the, the frets are very far apart. And so when you have really fast moving moving bass lines, it's just it's kind of cumbersome um, to get around it. So to, to tie this in with a question in the chat, what happened to the role of the continual player uh, after? the Baroque era, and it, it's, it morphs. It, we kind of see a change. Um, in Renaissance music, we see the, the role of the harmony distributed pretty equally throughout the different voices. 
And one of the kind of key revelations in moving into the the Basel Continuo um, era is that uh, the accompaniment players can actually write out this shorthand for that, and that's these uh, these figured bases. Um, and then we improvise on top of that. We don't need to have everything written out. In fact, they were probably improvising a lot in the Renaissance too. Um, and as we move into the 18th century, it becomes more and more keyboard uh, centric, and that just that just kind of continues. And and I would say the piano is probably. Uh, what we would think of as kind of the core accompaniment instrument for, for 19th century music, for instance. Um, moving into the 20th century, though, uh, I think the best place to think about what I, I think we find a really nice comparison for, for the Basso Continuo role in a jazz rhythm section or even a Motown rhythm section. Um, the relationship between a bass player and a drummer, especially the right hand of the drummer on the, on the cymbal, and just like like where they are sitting in, in, in the beat and like where the way that they're pushing the time forward and the feel that they're creating um, creates this space that the rest of the ensemble can interact in and re relate in. And that, that's how I see my role as a, as a continual player um, about creating this this like rhythmic space uh, and harmonic space for everyone else uh, in the ensemble. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for answering that. I, we have a separate Q&A section from the, the chat section, and you discovered the Q&A for me. So thank you for answering that, Joshua. Uh, Kiara, how, how about you as far as the concert uh, that we're performing? Any particular pieces, highlights a favorite piece or particularly challenging piece or what your approach kind of was to specific pieces you, you're playing on the program? Well, one thing I wanted to share with our listeners today is that actually the five of us playing who played yesterday and will play tomorrow, um, all went to school together at Juilliard. And so the reason I'm mentioning this is that it's been really great to meet again here two years after we have finished there, because it's really like coming home. Like we played together so much during our time in school. And it's amazing how like it's really been so much fun because we have all this common, we have covered all this common ground and we have a similar we've played together so much that we just, it's, it's easy to um, find our, combine our musical voices. And so that's been a really fun um, thing in the rehearsal process. Um, and also we know each other on stage and how we deal with stress and how we deal with performance. And so that's been really great um, to have that dependability on each other. Um, in terms of pieces, I, have a very hard time choosing because I really love the rep we um, were able to put together for both these programs. Um, in terms of tomorrow, I think two of the really interesting um, pieces that we're playing are the Bieber, which um, features two scordatura violins, scordatura meaning that they are tuned in different ways from the normal violin tuning, both of the violins. And I think it creates a really different um, sound world um, in this particular case because the reason Bieber writes it for a different tuning is so we can use a lot more open strings and a lot more chords meaning all the both violins often play more than one line at the time which then creates this huge sound it almost sounds like there's more instruments playing than are actually on stage <laughs> so I think that's a really um, cool sound world in itself that is quite different from the other pieces we're playing um, and the other piece that i'm also really excited to share with our audience is the oswald um, scott's um, sonata because it's just very different from your you know standard early music piece um, it's a sonata made of um, scottish tunes oswald himself was scottish as well and so it really is a collection of songs in a way and it's a really special piece as well Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, it struck me as you were talking about Scorda uh, Scorda violins. I mean, that sort of in the, the modern period, that sort of unified idea of like experimentation and creativity, like prepared piano. I mean, that these were the people on the cutting edge of music progression. And here we're, we have the violin, but we're going to tune it differently to explore, as you talked about, different sound worlds, like exploring the creative possibilities with a given sort of uh, the given sort of organology that you're dealing with or instruments. So we have just a few minutes left and we do have a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat. So to close out, uh, I'm going to direct our attention to those and ask one uh, first uh, from Gerald Kalstein that 
It says, uh, have any of the panelists come across composers from early music that you never heard before? And how do you approach these works? So, uh, you know, whether listening or performing, I guess, you know, that encounter, uh, maybe Caitlin, if you would like to kick things off with that and an encounter with early music. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, gosh, I mean, um, uh, now being so ingrained in this world, I, I um, have a far greater familiarity with um, uh, composers of harpsichord music and early music. Um, but I mean, when I first um, started playing the harpsichord, I had never heard of Louis Couperin or Frescobaldi or um, Elizabeth Jacques de la Guerre or so, so many people. Um, and um, it's, it's so fun um, to realize that there's just um, an enormous amount of music available to us. Um, and so many um, composers that we still have barely touched. Um, yeah, for example, there's um, there's this really wonderful manuscript I discovered this um, this year um, by a, a young girl um, in the 17th century, a, a girl who played for Louis XIV. Um, she was a student of uh, Francois Couperin. Um, he wrote a piece called La Mene II, um, dedicated to her in his piece de Clausin. And um, the piece doesn't exist in modern notation. It hasn't been recorded. Um, and it was published by this 12 year old girl, um, the youngest girl to publish in, in France in the 17th century. And um, so many possibilities there are so many uh, uh, works like that that are still you know, floating in this world. And um, so I guess that's my answer. Um, I've become aware of so many composers and I'm excited to keep discovering more um, throughout my lifetime, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it is It is tough. The question is, you know, this encounter, but for many of us who come to early music from another world, I mean, that initial process is this period of like, who is this person, you know, yeah. discovery, if it's not Bach or Handel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Greg, how, Greg, how about you? Similar to Caitlin in many respects, it was, I got into choral music when I was in college. I was primarily a pianist, had studied organ, then started accompanying the college choirs. I was familiar with certain hip information and hip ensembles, but the more I studied, I took a historical musicology courses when I was an undergrad, and then I thought, oh, wow, Crequillon or you know, Combert, and especially that, at the point where I was getting increasingly into vocal music, I just kept trying to go back in time here and go back in history and find all of these just amazing pieces, and again, some of which have never been published in modern notation. And so what do you do with that? And then of course, with even with certain late Renaissance works, there are so many possibilities if you have a skilled vocal ensemble to take that notation and say, take away the bar lines and give everybody one on a part and see how that works and how people listen to one another. And so I'm still discovering things and it's really rewarding. Absolutely. I, the, the figures in my dissertation, not, no modern edition. So it's, it's, there's still so many to be discovered. So thank you for that. that. Uh, how about Kira and Joshua? I feel like there's still constantly composers I've never heard of, which is really exciting. <laughs> like even, or, or composers we know so little about. But for instance, for our, from our concert yesterday, the carol, how many people have heard of this composer? I certainly had not before. It's an amazing piece. Or on the other hand, someone like Castello, the violin sonata that Manami played. The Castello, he is quite well known as a composer, but actually we know extremely little about him, almost nothing. So as such, I feel like how do we approach the music? Well, obviously we try to find out stuff about the composer, but then I think we approach it probably from what other music do we know from similar times and places? And how does that relate maybe to music we already know? And how is it different? And, you know, I think it's it's a little bit, of course, somewhat of a guessing game, but I think we can make fairly informed guesses based on other music that we know better from the same time period. Yeah, it's, how about Joshua? 
Yeah, I I totally echo what Kiara just said, and and I would add maybe that I guess at at this point, having you know been basically playing only early music or primarily early music for a number of years, and I've covered quite a bit of rep. I feel like I'm. I have a little bit of a sense of 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 if I'm playing like early 16th century Italian music, um, this is ki kind of how the ensemble is going to work more or less. And if I see this figure on a, on the page, I know more or less what I I should do. Um, whereas even if like only you know maybe 30 years later, north of the Alps, up in Germany or Austria, it's a very different sound world. You know, very inspired by that, but but there's some significant differences. And if you uh, have music from the same time, but from France, it's like it's a whole different world. Um, so I think I have a lot more to learn about that. There's a lot of music out there that I haven't played, which is which is super exciting. <laughs> um, but I think that's that's the way that I would approach it. Like Yada said, kind of uh, framework it with other repertoire that's geographically similar um, and of a similar time, with the kind of awareness that you know, just like in today's popular music, you know give it 10 or 20 years, things are going to change a lot. Like the conventions of what we think are, are, are sounding normal change a lot over a, a decade or so. And uh, that was certainly equally, equally true in the 17th century, I would say. Yes, and not always a lot of agreement even between air. You know, friends, French would always say things about Italians because they didn't always like the Italian. You know, they had to, they didn't like the castrato sound as much, and so the, it, there's not a lot of agreement. And then in Austria, they loved it. You know, we have Italians everywhere. This is the best thing. So yeah, that's a good point to bring out. Uh, so in closing, I'm going to ask Pat's question, and that ties into the last question I kind of had, and that will conclude our evening. Pat uh, Virga asks, from your many performances does any one or two stand out in your mind as particularly special and that will serve as sort of my final question of we're going to leave you know your concerts loving early music i'm sure all of us with a newfound appreciation so what are your sort of recommendations for anyone who wants to go out and discover more who are some composers or pieces to start with maybe drawing from your own experience so oh haha -ha. don't don't stop being a moderator yet greg why don't we start with you well, I know he's not an unknown composer, but one of my best discoveries of late Baroque music was, of course, discovering the vocal works of Handel, not just Messiah, but his many other oratorios. And when I was a doctoral student at Indiana, we, uh, the Pro Arte Singers, which was one of the early music choirs, small chamber chorus of about 20 to 24 singers, depending on the situation. We teamed up with the Baroque Orchestra, which was part of the early music. It was then known as the Early Music Institute. Now it's the Historical Performance Institute. But we came together and did a performance of Handel's Judas Maccabeus. And I had known the piece on the perif peripherally, but it's just with the Baroque Orchestra and the democratic way of rehearsing and the smaller group of singers is just you hear counterpoint and there's a certain transparency that you that you just don't get with say the performances with masses of people on the stage and it inspired me later to write my thesis on Handel's Jephtha which is his final oratorio and it criminally underrated Thank you for that recommendation, Greg. Yeah, Handel's one of those ones where it's like, oh, I know Handel. And every time I pick him up to listen again, it's like, oh my gosh, Handel is amazing. So thank you for the, those recommendations, Judas Maccabeus and Jephtha. Uh, Caitlin, how about you? Um, gosh, well, um, to, to speak um, to your, your question about um, the favorite performance experience, um, I always think about the first uh, orchestra project I was in um, at Juilliard. I, I was fresh from a piano degree um, in my undergrad and hadn't played too much continuo yet. Um, and I um, was the second harpsichord to William Christie um, for a, a Monteverdi project. Um, and among the, the pieces we, it was all um, kind of Monteverdi book eight works, um, including his Ballo dell'ingrate and um, some selections by other composers. But I just remember um, one piece in particular um, 
being on stage and looking around me and hearing these amazing musicians who are now my colleagues um, in the band um, ornamenting and, and creating this gorgeous sound world and just feeling so inspired by everyone around me and the, the sound of everyone around me and um, getting to be a continual player and um, getting to enjoy the sounds of other people and figuring out a, a way to become a part of it and to take their sound and and create something around it um, and with it and and through it is just like the most rewarding experience as a musician I could ever think of. Um, and those sorts of moments to me um, stand out the most. Um, and uh, to go along with that, um, as an audience member, um, I would recommend um, just listening to a lot of um, music that's from the era of the Basso Continuo, like uh, Josh men mentioned. Um, music from the early 17th century um, that is all about um, this, this new thing of the Basso Continuo where it's multiple instruments and creating this sound world. And you know, if you pull up a score, it's a lot of whole notes for the continual players. And then you have to create something out of that. It's like all whole notes and maybe four or five different harmonies, but then you have this amazing rhetorical vocal part or, or you know, um, violin part. And you have to um, create something just as magical around it. Um, that's an amazing set of repertoire to listen to, so. Yeah, so fi finding yourselves in that era right around 1600 you do a little yeah. google search music from 1600 and <laughs> give yourself a listen right and you'll hear the commonalities i think between the instruments uh, uh joshua how about you recommendations or one or two standout performances from your life yeah so there's there's a lot of great music out there uh, i i should first say um for people interested in the Theorbo, I know this is like maybe some people are very familiar with it, but if you're not and you would like to hear more, I recommend um, checking out maybe some Piccinini, uh, Alessandro Piccinini, who was a composer uh, in Italy in the early 17th century. Also, um, Capsburger is another great one. There's been a record that I've been listening to uh, recently by Carlos Oramas of, of Capsburger music, which is really great. Um, I'd like to make a particular plug for uh, some of the music north of the Alps. Like I have been listening to this new record that just came out this year by Ensemble Correspondance in France uh, of Membra Jesu Nostri, which is an incredible piece by Bux de Huda, and it's just like really, really intensely beautiful music. Um, I'd also recommend music by Franz Tunder, another kind of underrated composer of, of that era. And I really like Carlo Farina, uh, who wrote some violin sonatas um, also around the same time. And it's just interesting, you know, to hear this kind of uniquely uh, German take on the Italian things that were happening at the time. Uh, in terms of a highlight performance, there's been a lot. Um, it's hard to pick just one, but the last live actual live concert I played, uh, I guess at the beginning of March of last year was in Invercargill, New Zealand, the southernmost tip of the South Island, one of the southernmost cities in, in the world. Um, and it was a really emotional experience to perform that concert because we had just finished a really intense uh, 10 concert tour of, of all across New Zealand. Um, and there was so much uncertainty. We had, you know, we were getting the news like, concert season's canceled, like, we're probably not doing any more performances, like, school's done, like, you know, we had no idea what was coming. And so to play that last concert and know, like, know that it might be the last one for a while, uh, and also have it be this music that we've played so many times. So there was, you know, the more you play music, the same repertoire, I feel like you can, you can get this, uh, always these deeper layers of meaning. Um, that was a really, a really special experience on the very bottom of the world. And it's uh, cool to have some colleagues uh, who were there. Manami was actually in the orchestra as well, um, and to be to be here playing with them uh, this week, it's really it's really great to be back. That sounds phenomenal. Thank you for sharing, and I'm very happy that you got to be in New Zealand, <laughs> playing such wonderful music. And we'll close things out, Kiara. Yeah. Well, in terms of recordings um, that I 
would love to recommend to our audience. Um, one of the ones, if especially if people are maybe less familiar with early music or just getting into it, um, is um, by violinist Amandine Byers, her recording of the Matthes songs, which are so beautiful and so... Matthes truly knew how to write a melody. It's just unbelievable. And at the same time, they're so easy to listen to. Like it's, I, I would say it's the easy listening of, <laughs> of early music, but in the best way possible. So I highly recommend that recording. And of course, also for anyone interested, but um, maybe this is more for people who are already <laughs> um, are more into um, early music before earlier the um, Bach Cantare das by Masaki Suzuki were mentioned. And I think he's just such an inspired director and such a wonderful person. And in, in terms of your question of uh, highlights in performance, I think the performances I got to do with him um, during my time at Juilliard were truly some of my favorite in my life. Well, thank you very much for sharing. I will drop one more piece for people that I've performed and would recommend. You could do worse uh, for early music than anything by Monteverdi. And I'm dropping just the Lagrime d'Amante al Sepulcro della Amata. This is a Sestina six verse form, uh, very uh, gut wrenching sort of poetry and very virtuosic in its own way, but worth a listen. With that, I would like to thank each of our panelists for the time for a little bit of extra time sharing your expertise and your your insight and your orientation towards this sort of field of music making and musicking that is not always the most familiar to people so thank you all very very much for taking the time to walk us through the field and uh so thank you again and i'm going to pass things back to uh, Babette now for our closing. So thank you again, panelists, and you all have a wonderful concert tomorrow. I'm sure it will be amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. This has been delightful. It's been informative. I'm sure everyone appreciates your, your skill at guiding the discussion. Thank you all to the wonderful panelists uh, who made the evening so enjoyable. Uh, tomorrow night, June 10th at seven o'clock, uh, there will be another performance. And tickets for additional information, visit the festival's website at www.princetonfestival.org. Now I'd just like to say a few words about the Princeton Festival Guild Membership is made up of enthusiasts who enjoy and want to support the Princeton Festival. We collaborate with the festival to help create its many educational and community programs designed to excite, inform, inspire, and engage. If you're not yet a member of the Guild, we hope you'll consider joining. Before you leave, we ask you to take a few minutes to complete a very short survey by clicking the link on your screen. The information provided by you, for you um, and by you serves the festival in numerous ways. We depend on your suggestions for making your, our programs even better in the future. Thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the Princeton Festival. Good night.